this is the beginning of the episode. And I got a lot of problems with you people. I feel like we should have a episode that's what did they what was it on um Festivus? An airing of the grievances. Oh <laughs> from Seinfeld. You know, they had this I think that at the end of August before Labor Day, when the stress is the highest, you've had a shitty month because it's hot and slow as fuck, and no one's taking anything you say seriously. I think that we should have a landscape festivus where we have an airing of the grievances and we get everyone around and we sit down and we share our grievances with each set of people that work, our suppliers, our manufacturers, our employees. Um, we should all sit around our vendors and just have an airing of the fucking grievances. That's where I'm at. Time for uh. With the airing of the grievances, motherfucker. This is are we gonna wrestle it's, it's someone landscape at the end? Festivus right now? Oh yeah. <laughs> There's a the wrestling. Fight. That's isn't there fighting or something at the end of it? The, Festivus the, the, the isn't feats, over until you pin someone. It's the feats of strength. <laughs> yeah. On to the feats of strength. What should we use instead of a pole? We should use like uh you know, like they used to have like a steel rod or something, a steel pole. What what's a landscaping Festivus? how about a piece of uh proprietary uh edging? Ooh, That's fucking perfect. That is. And what we could do is dip it in a a plastic barrel and do wet it for some reason. <laughs> no one, totally understands. One of those rubber made bins. That's a super inside joke that no one listening to the well, some people listening to this might get it, but um so with the airing of the grievances, I uh I'm gonna read this instead of play it. And I'm just gonna go through it here. And if I don't keep up, everyone can understand I'm a landscaper. And I mean, the fact that I'm reading something off the internet is is probably close enough that to. Has changed oh, about- shoot. No, that's my volumes on. How do we start this again? Go back to the beginning, you stupid. F- okay, you guys ready? All right. So here's what I've learned after owning a Rolex for about a month. One thing that has changed about me is when I have a watch on and I'm sitting in my office on my cell phone and I have sixteen or $17,000 watch on, it actually makes me become more disciplined because it levels my mindset. And if I don't have a watch, I'm going to sit there sculpturing on TikTok, watching people fight or something stupid, but I have a watch on and I get like into my mindset and I'm like, well, damn, I got to get the next one. Or it's just, it's just a different mindset. And I answer emails and I make posts and I use social media the right way. So that's what changed after owning a Rolex for a month. If you need a fucking Rolex (laughs) to know that you should be sending some emails, you're a fucking idiot. And you made an excuse for buying a fucking Rolex. What do you guys think of that whole shit? Other than the fact that that guy obviously yeah. is in better shape than me because I was barely getting through that and not catching my breath. So let's just assume he's in good shape and he's working out and he's got his fucking Rolex. Do you guys need a Rolex to keep your mindset, to keep you planted, to keep you busy and working? Like the two of you were just so before this background, before this started, these two were working and delayed going on here. And I think it's because both of them saw their Rolex and said, fuck, I got to get work done. And the podcast pays nothing. Fuck Mike in the podcast. He can sit in the fucking waiting room by himself. We got our Rolexes to pay for. So what do you guys think of this Rolex situation? You signing up? I don't have a Rolex. I don't even have a Timex. Like, I have an Apple Watch that I most often forget to wear. Mm. Um. And the only reason I bought it was to monitor my heart because I thought a couple of years ago I was going to keel over and die on the job site. I mm-hmm. feel like my heart rate was a bit high. But uh, no, I don't need a Rolex to tell me to do my work. But here's the thing. Does this guy, like, first off, I don't know who he is, but he's oh, chasing you know. Rolex. I, maybe I, is he chasing Rolexes? Like he wants to you buy know, another? Applied he applied to wants, his university. I applied to his Mr. Wilfred Laurier? Yeah. <laughs> Is that you? No. I he's not know. saying he's, well, I guess part of it he says he's chasing the Rolex, but a big part of it he's saying, I need a Rolex on my wrist to remind me of the mindset I need to get a Rolex. I just think that's. I think that's ridiculous. I, I, if you need a watch to remind you of the things you need to do to be successful, 
you probably are never going to be actually successful. I think it's just an excuse, like you said, to uh, using a, a material object to uh, flex on the followers so that he gets more people interested in his program and then to just use it in some way to talk up a, a his mindset and stuff. Personally, but uh, I'm also not of the mindset that I need a Rolex to push myself. I have no rolex no. i also have an apple watch that i thought would monitor my health and then discovered i was unhealthy and so i stopped wearing it because <laughs> it's better to In be the middle of the... i think sometimes i'll be wearing my watch and oh my internet's fucked you're fine i can hear you you're, i can hear you i'm fine, fine. yeah you I think it. everybody needs a, it needs a reason to push themselves. For, so if it's if it's a Rolex you need to push yourself, then I'll be it. But uh, I think there's better reasons to push yourself a little harder out there. I well, I don't. Chad's gone. His internet's yeah. gone. We're making. Up, how are we going to cover the space without Chad? I don't know. I. I guess that's. I'm not a, a material possession kind of person, so I don't. I understand that mindset. Yeah. But I guess if that's what you need to get yourself going in the morning is I need 10 Rolexes. If that's I and hey, if that's what makes you feel good about yourself, I guess I'm no one to criticize it as long as you're a happy person and you're not I guess in theory fucking people over and you're you need to have a Rolex to work hard. It just seems like how did you work hard enough to get a Rolex? Like, how did you work hard enough to get what? What did you stare at every day in order to earn the money to get the Rolex so you could stare at it to remind you you have to work hard? Like, did you have a fake Rolex? And every morning you looked at the fake Rolex and said, fuck, I got to work hard so I can make this into a real Rolex. Because this fake one that I bought off the street vendor in New York is not real. I don't, what do you have to do to get, what do you use to get in the mindset to get the real fucking Rolex? That's my question. What do you guys think? Maybe it's an inherited Rolex. Mm. I don't know. It, it, it was purchased. The whole mindset is flawed from the start to me. <laughs> if this is, like you say, where did the original Rolex come from? And why are you of the idea that you need multiple Rolexes? I think anybody who wants to be smart in business will realize that one Rolex is probably enough, if not more than enough, and then put their money towards something else. Uh, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I guess. Yeah. Maybe. Well, shouldn't you be of the mindset that you want to buy assets as opposed to liabilities? Well, uh, Rolex, and is the, major, the Rolex is a major asset. That's not an argument. If you wear it every day, yeah. I don't oh, know. They only, they only increase in value. That's true. Well, like, I'm, I'm not saying all watches. I'm saying that particular brand of watches guaranteed that watch will be worth more in five years than it's worth now. As long as it doesn't get damaged on his wrist. Even if it gets damaged and it gets repaired, it, they're just so valuable. There's so but, few of them. And the, they only, they only make a quarter of the demand per year. Like that. Well, I'm not saying all watches. I'm saying that watch, if it is actually real, in particular is a is an asset that will increase in value but not most watches just that particular brand but um but i i, I don't know maybe it is an asset i that is an asset for sure but is it what uh, like you talking more like a house chad chad <laughs> Chad. I'm going to reset my router. You guys go on. I'll be back. Chad, right. Chad's resetting his router. Fuck. <laughs> that podcast is going to fall apart. We're Chad's losing the Chad. intermediary. Uh, yeah. So would you buy a Rolex there, PK? Is that what you're saying? Would I buy a Rolex? No. Yeah. If it's, it's an not appreciating an asset. asset? Not, well, it is an appreciating asset, but I don't want it. No. I don't want any. I don't buy anything because it's appreciating in value ever. I buy things that I want. 
I would rather have something that I want and I enjoy that's depreciating than something I have no interest in that's appreciating. How many appreciating assets can they stuff in your coffin that you didn't enjoy? That's very true. You wouldn't enjoy a watch on your wrist at all? I don't wear the watch I have. <laughs> I'm going to suddenly start wearing the watch because it's worth 17000 bucks or 30000 bucks. That's even a fucking expensive Rolex. I would be super nervous to have something like that and actually wear it because I would lose it or it would get broken for sure. So that's why I don't even bother getting into those types of things. Uh, I don't. That's not me as a person. I have friend, lots of friends with Rolexes. I have a friend with a Rolex that's worth 50 grand he wears every day. Did they buy it to push themselves? So I sent him that. Yeah. And he said that's how he feels about his. Really? Yeah. He's a very successful guy and a very good friend of mine that I respect very much. But it would make sense that somebody who owns it, that would be they, those would be the types of people that own them, right? I guess. He had a different watch before. Yeah. Uh, much less expensive watch. And uh, that watch he wore, and then that pushed him to want a more expensive watch. Interesting. So I, you know, and then he he's a smart person and a hard worker. So I don't have any, I just sent it to him out of interest because I was like, oh, what do you, is this how you feel about your watch? Because I want it, I, me having an opinion on it as someone who doesn't have a watch like that yeah. isn't particularly fair to the guy who posted that video. Is he, this person married? Or yes. do they have kids? They really, yes. wow. Because I can see if you're single that you would need a, a reason outside of just yourself to maybe push yourself. But uh, maybe once you get married, that becomes the reason. And especially once you have kids, that yeah, increases the reason to kind of push yourself. Yeah. But that just that's just me thinking about me and myself, I guess. I. I I don't feel like if it makes you happy, the pursuit of material possessions is bad. If that's no, makes, absolutely. Yeah. If that's what if that's what drives you forward and makes you happy, I don't think it's particularly bad. If you believe having a fancy car or a fancy boat or a monstrous fucking house or whatever, if you believe that that's what's going to make your life worthwhile and happy, then balls to the wall, go for it. Mm -hmm. I got like I it does it just because it's not what I think want to achieve doesn't make it. I don't really have a goal or purpose, so that could be part of the issue. If I had some clear purpose or goal, I maybe would be better off, but I don't. You don't write down your goals on a vision board? I don't have any goals. I certainly <laughs> don't have a vision. Do I look like someone? I Well, your vision board is the people that owe you money behind you. <laughs> <laughs> As, and I'm always looking. That are always behind me, right? So. <laughs> You want to air some grievances, motherfucker? <laughs> it's not the feats of strength or the fucking paper king unpaid account board. That's, uh, <laughs> have some feats of strength up on that motherfucker. Uh, I don't know. I don't think it's a ter like a. I think, it's I think a there's worse money to spend your money on then. If if Rolex is increased in value, there's definitely sports cars uh, you can I spend your money on that decrease in value very quickly. I mean, people consume vast amounts of money at steakhouses and stuff. There's a world like, you know, Absolutely. I've, I've been a party to dinners that were $7,000 for six people. I haven't. I have. Yeah. I'm just saying like, it's, I, so there's people spending massive amounts of money just eating food. Right. There's, and I don't know if that's an appreciating asset when it comes out the other end. <laughs> I don't think it is. <laughs> I don't think it's appreciating asset. I don't think so. So either. this was what this was my interest. I had another topic I was going to talk about too. What the fuck was my other one? Anyways, I found that interesting that maybe and maybe I was wrong. Maybe now that I've talked it out with you guys, maybe I was I, first time I watched that I was like, this guy's a fucking idiot. I thought so too. Uh, immediately, I think that's why I, I sent it to you guys. Is that how you found it? Well, you sent it to me, yeah. Oh, okay. But then when I sent it to someone that actually has a Rolex, and they were like, yeah, I relate to that. I was like, oh, maybe this guy's not such a fucking idiot. <laughs> and I'm a little bit tainted in my view of it, and maybe I should have a second look at it. So perhaps I was... Uh... I think this is where like 
talking to you, talking to Chad on this podcast, I think that we all have similar values, I think. So I think that we would all three of us be among the same mindset of not spending our money on material things like that and focusing on other things that drive us. But perhaps it'd be good to have somebody like uh, like that on the podcast as a guest to dissect their mindset a little bit more. Opposing uh, viewpoints when compared to yeah. us, I think. I don't. I don't know. Like, well, what's your is your ultimate goal to like retire when you're 50? No, I don't have a goal like that. So what, because even what when are you I waking up, what are you waking up every morning for then? What do you you have a lot of shit going on? You have a landscaping business. You have a the How to Heartscape podcast. You have this podcast. You have the Heartscape headquarters software that you're working on all the time and training people to use all by yourself. Uh, like, why are you getting up every morning if it's not for a Rolex? It's not for a Rolex. I don't think it's about um, primarily anything to do with like money or material things. I just try to get up each morning and do something that benefits people outside of myself. And I think if you focus on that and that might be like Lottie Dottie or whatever, but I think if I focus on that and I continue to focus on that and same thing with my landscaping business and going out there and doing something for somebody else, the more I focus on that, the more everything else that I want will follow. So So what is it that you want? That's my question. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I think I just want to be able to uh, provide for my family without any struggle in that and to have some sort of wealth at the end of it. There's Chad. He's back. That's about how my whole day has been going. Yeah. Hi, guys. Hey, so what? Like when you say some sort of wealth, what do you determine? Mike is, we're trying to figure out because Mike hardly ever talks on this podcast, <laughs> not as much as us. I and you were gone, Chad, so I could ask him direct questions and pin the motherfucker down. <laughs> and I asked him, "Why is he doing all?" Because he's doing a lot of shit. So the oh, argument, while you and me are just spinning our wheels and getting nowhere. <laughs> no, but people's impression will always be that your business and my business are bigger than Mike's business, mm. but. That's not necessarily true because Mike has 15 other things that he's got going on other than a landscaping business. And I can admit, other than driving my daughter to soccer and watching NYPD Blue, I have fuck all else going on. Here's my NYPD thing on the whole Blue. thing. <laughs> I think Mike is setting himself up for uh, a different, uh, the real type of wealth, right? Where he can not not necessarily sit back, but uh, the fruits of his hard work will come in uh, residually and more often than maybe you or I who have to go out and grind. I hard. think we all are. I just think I'm doing it in a very different way, right? Well, we still don't you know what you are, are probably. Well, you, yeah, you definitely want yeah. of the three of us. The uh, what? the smartest of the three of us. Oh God. I don't think, I don't think (laughs) so. I think that's why I talk the least on this podcast, because when you're in the room with smarter people than yourself, you should just sit back and listen for the most. The dumbest person is the loudest person. (laughs) You PK talks. I see the waveform. I edit the episodes. I see the waveform. I know exactly who talks the most. PK talks. No, the loudest, not the one who talks the most. I don't disagree with that. I've been in rooms with incredibly smart, successful people where I say nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I have nothing to add to what's the conversation. And and I'm like, I don't, my life experience is not these people's life experience. And they are talking above my level of things that I've done and I can learn from that. So I just shut my mouth and stand there. Maybe I feel like I don't have anything to learn from the two of you. That's fine. I and that's why I talk constantly. To, <laughs> you don't have much to learn from me. I think you've done everything that I've done, and then some. Oh, I but, text uh, you. I text you for information on Sunday when I was pricing a job. You did. Are you? Sure? I said, "What's your bare minimum for hydro seed?" Oh, that's right. That's true. And Chad's um, bare minimum is eighteen hundred bucks, and he's coming to Ajax to do it for me. So I appreciate that. 
Thanks Ooh. for that. Yeah, you just put me right out there. I, I uh, <laughs> hope the... my latest Hydra C client doesn't know that because I was going to charge him twenty two hundred. I, hope, I don't, th- <laughs> I don't think he listens to the podcast. So you're probably okay. well. You never know. He could be one of our five hundred loyal weekly listeners. So um, if it, well, that being said, to your client, I included twenty five hundred for Chad because I knew he had to travel. Well, I allowed twenty. To which I'll come back and say, "Well, he's only traveling twenty minutes for me and four hours for you." So. Well, but that's that's three hundred. Wow, obviously he's not on a podcast with you. Yeah, true. I get the podcast discount. The the podcast NDL (laughs) ten, NDL (laughs) ten. Good nowhere but on this podcast. (laughs) It's the only place you can use NDL ten. I'm using my NDL (laughs) ten. So, (laughs) I honestly think one of my problems is I don't want anything and I have no goal, and I think that that's a problem. Because now recently, I feel like we've turned a corner and things are going better at the company. I for everybody, me included, I feel like we have some things that we're trying to attain, and some things are falling into place, and some things are starting to work out. And I just feel like maybe we hit the bottom of the escalator and we're on the slow climb back up. So uh, I feel good about that. But I don't have any. I want my kids to be able to do whatever the fuck they want to do. That's my goal. That's all I really care about. I don't want them denied some opportunity because their dad was too stupid and couldn't make enough money that they couldn't do the thing they wanted to do. Are you talking about for their whole lives or while they're under yeah, your well, house? I guess that's fair. I'm talking about when if Paisley wants to be a forensic scientist. Okay. She has to go to school for that. Now she has to work. That's a lot of chemistry and shit. So that's a lot of hard work on her end, but I don't want her to not be able to do that because her dad couldn't pay the bill at university. So mm-hmm. you just don't want the money to be the barrier, right? I don't want them to have a barrier to the things they want to do. Yeah. Gotcha. I guess, right. but maybe I should put up a barrier so that they're better. They work harder. I don't know. It's hard. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you can on. eliminate that variable for them i think they're further ahead do you how, how much and i guess i'll ask this to pk as well how much would you guys help out your children or how much do you think that a barrier would help them succeed even more and push them even more uh, so paisley soccer is crazily expensive sport it's insanely like it's you know, probably more expensive than AAA hockey. Wow! Like it's crazy. Well, like the, you're flying to Vancouver for tournaments oh. for a week and stuff. Or we went to anyways. It's a it's an expensive venture. I don't you marrying it to other things. It's a very expensive venture. That being said, I don't want her barrier to be a financial one to be able to play at the level she plays at. I want the barrier to be she needs to make the team. If she doesn't put in the hard work to play at an elite level and make the team, that's her barrier. My barrier is making sure I can pay the bill. But I don't want her to make the team and then she can't play because I can't, I can't hold up my end. Right. I don't want her to have to go get a job or collect pop bottles on the street or so that she can pay her bill for soccer. Mm-hmm. I want, I'll pay the bill for soccer, but I, I don't want to buy the team and put her on the team. Because that's me eliminating all the barriers. As right. a parent. If I, and that happens in like right up to OHL hockey now, there's guys buy, like that guy bought the Flint, Michigan, the Flint team literally just so he could put his son on it. <laughs> and then they, they, they put his son on the power play and it's, his son was in no way an OHL hockey player, but he bought the OHL team just to put. So I think that that's someone who's deleting all the barriers for their kid. I don't want my kid to have a financial, like, I don't want her to look at soccer and be like, I can't play at that level because my parents can't afford to pay for that level. I want her to look at soccer and say, I can't play at that level because I didn't make the team or I worked hard and I made the team, but my dad didn't buy my way on the team. Would you watch the coach's kids or take care of them or whatever else shit goes on? (laughs) Would you want your kid to have a a job though, like a part-time job? Uh, so to be fair, 
her her and Paisley in particular, she plays soccer six days a week and maintains a ninety over ninety percent average so that she can, wants a scholarship to the states. Right. And she um she's and we have to drive back and forth. Like she's probably spends twenty five hours a week at soccer. Wow. And then she spends because she has to go to extra practices because she's a goalkeeper and then they make, she has to study tape and she has to cut video and send it to the coaches of goals that were scored or saves that were made. This is a very, like, it's a long process for her. They like on Saturday, she played in Kingston. So drive to Kingston, drive home. She does all her homework in the car while we're driving to keep up. I, for her, as long as she's maintaining that average and playing soccer at this level, I don't think she needs to get a job. Right. Soccer soccer is her job. That's her job to be successful at it. There's a lot of work that goes in, not just physical work, but there's a lot of like homework, they call it. That's her job. If she decides to play soccer at a house league level, where she's going once a week to play a game, and she's maintaining a 90 average, I think then she has time and space for a part-time job, and she should get one hmm. to help pay her way. But if, you're, if she's doing elite sports, then yeah, I want absolutely. to be in a position to pay for that that's my take on it i don't know what's your take Jen? well i don't have a daughter that's of that age i have a five-year-old she, so she doesn't work at ndl yet she doesn't work at ndl uh yet although she likes extrapolating to extrapolating 10 years from now um that's hard to say right because you had 10 years to build up this plethora of, of knowledge mm -hmm. and sort of run it through your head a million times of what you do with a child that is phenomenal at sports, right? I'd like to think I'd do the same thing as you, where if Maggie was a great uh, soccer player or something, then we'd focus solely on her sport. And thankfully, I'm in a position where NDL can facilitate that, where she wouldn't need to get a part-time job and we could afford to send her to wherever she needed to go. Um, I could subscribe to that, but I don't think having a part-time job would be a bad thing. I think it's it's important to build um, life skills by getting shitty jobs and doing things you don't want to do and getting up at times you don't want to get up at and having someone yell at you or tell you you're not doing something right. Like I think there's a lot to be said for having those moments growing up, like when I worked in the meat department and shit, I didn't want to get up at seven o'clock in the morning and be hung over for work <laughs> and put my head against the, uh, the hopper of the hamburger machine because I had such a bad headache because I had three hours sleep and I was probably still drunk, but I got up and did it because that's what my job was. And you go to your job, right? Like you didn't, but arguably what, that is is teaching work ethic and what uh pk's daughter is learning through how much she has to play soccer is work ethic right yeah there, there's absolutely more than one way to learn work ethic right so uh, so not this week well it was last wednesday she they played a team that hadn't lost in i don't know like 20 months or something and her team was crazily dominating the game for whatever reason and with like 15 minutes in she let in a terrible goal and they went down one nothing when they should have probably been up two nothing and she fished the ball out of the net and she looked at them all and she basically said that's it for the night and then she is the best game i've ever seen her play in her whole life and i've watched her play a lot <laughs> of soccer um she didn't let in another goal no matter what she had to do for the rest of the night and they ended up winning 3-1 which was in her I world and in crazy big deal. And I, when the game was over and I was watching how happy she was, I thought all the hours that I spent driving, all the money that we've spent, all the, all the hours we've all spent driving, all the money that we've spent. If she learns mental toughness, resilience, and a belief in herself, then it was all worth it. And because those things, no one can take away from her when she gets older, if those are ingrained in her personality and that's what this achieved, 
then I, I feel like she's, I, I think that Chad's right. There's a lot of life experiences. Letting in a terrible goal in front of 200 people and watching 100 people scream and yell and cheer about the huge mistake you just made, I feel like that's some tough life experience. You know, pretty hard and ring cowbells and blow air horns. And I feel like, you know, play a huge ghetto blaster with inane rap music and dance around. Because that wasn't he, you, was it? <laughs> no, because it was my daughter that fucked up. Um, I think you're learning. I think that Chad's right. You need those life experiences. And that's why if she was playing at a different level, I would want her to have a job like Chad said, because I feel like that's where she's going to get those life experiences. I, But at this level, I feel like she's getting some of those life experiences Chad was talking about because it's, you know, you have to fish the ball out of the net and look at all your, the other 10 girls on the field and they all know you just let them down. And then you need to make a decision that I'm not going to do it again. No matter what happens for the rest of this game, I'm never letting these girls down again. And she didn't. And it paid off for them. I, I just feel like there's that type of mental toughness is some, and it's the same as I'm hungover and I got to go to the fucking meat grinder and I can't grind my fucking arm off and I got to pick that's <laughs> That's meant no, that's mental toughness to get up and do that, man. Because there's out five out of ten people probably don't get up and go in on that shift. Yeah. That's I I didn't learn mental toughness playing elite sports. I learned mental toughness the same way as chat. Getting up and going, <laughs> fuck. I am <laughs> fucking wasted. And I gotta go and lay and lay 45 skids of sod on a Saturday. Yeah, yeah, that's where I learned mental talk and being able to put yourself in a different place to get work done. But I think they're both admirable. That, and if she wasn't playing, I she needs to get a job and learn some. I just don't think she has time for everything and she's going to burn. And that happened to her last year. She was doing way too many things. And we had a lot of talks about it. She was burnt out. She was exhausted. She was on like three school teams plus her soccer team. Plus she was doing, I don't know, five other things. I said, okay, next year you got to focus on Doing the things you actually really, really want to do because it's too much and it's too many things and you're getting pulled too many ways. Mm -hmm. But that's a tough life lesson too. She figured out that she was way too busy and she couldn't, and it, she learned that I can't make 10 commitments, which is good for business, especially if she wants to take over a landscaping company because we all know landscapers make way too many <laughs> commitments. <laughs> Doing too I mean, many I things. I think of myself. Yeah. What? Yeah, I'm supposed to be too many places at once right now. Our new scheduling thing is working out pretty good. Nice. Yeah, it's pretty good. And and it has a time clock that doesn't work because it's geo tracked and there's no fucking reception at our yard where everyone's <laughs> supposed to check in and out of. So there's that problem that we're dealing with, but but it's working out. I kind I kind I have like a big screen in the office and it actually shows the whole schedule and they're all color coded and it's pretty good. Nice. Pretty happy, pretty happy with it. Yeah. So far, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> uh, scheduling part of it, I think, is going to be good. The uh, time thing, I don't know if that's going to. We might. I told them that everyone's filling out time cards for at least a month. We're not trusting this motherfucking thing till we know because it's how they get paid. We, and I learned at a young age: don't fuck with how people get paid. I think we've talked about the time that the checks ended up in the wrong mailbox at the first company I worked at. <laughs> yes, we did. That's yeah. unbelievable. Like if someone trashed my truck or something because their check was in the wrong mailbox, they would be out of a job and out of that paycheck. And then they come back and burn the shop down. <laughs> it's insured and we'll go to jail for arson. I don't like that's just unbelievable that someone would kick in the truck door or whatever he did uh i think that also pertains to how people are being treated before that happens yeah i feel yeah. like if you're i don't know how you treat your employees actually but my impression yeah. is that you treat them fairly well because you've had the same employees for a long time and yeah. you seem to get along with them and they literally live in your shop well, some, so, yeah. some. so I feel like you're pretty fair with them. So if their checks weren't in the mailbox and they, they couldn't get hold yeah. of you, they would probably all go home and assume they'd get paid the next day. But obviously something went wrong. Obviously there's a problem because it they uh, the checks are always there. I feel like 
that's a different experience than what we were all having at the other company. Yeah. So I understand that. Yeah. There, we had we had this guy once. It was last year. No, probably two or three years ago. And oh boy, he uh, got fired because he didn't show up on a Wednesday. It was during COVID. And then we got a, I get a message at like 10 o'clock. He said, sorry, I was in the hospital with my brother all night. And I said, no, you weren't. It's COVID. You're not allowed visitors in the hospital. Like you're completely lying. Anyway, (laughs) you're fired because (laughs) you're a lying piece of shit. It's your first week of work and this isn't going to fly. And he waited a week and then he said, where's my pay? And I said, oh, I'll tape a check to the front door of the the office at the yard. That's not finished. And he goes, well, what's the address? Dude, you worked here for like two days and you drove yourself to work. What do you mean you don't know the address? Like, I think what, it would be in same, his GPS. Yeah, like it's, Cornwall's not a big city. It's not a hard place to, to find this office or the yard. He's like, well, I don't know the address of the yard, so I can't get it. Then, well, I don't know what you want me to tell you. He's like, I'll call. Uh, what do you call? Whenever you're having trouble getting paid or something, labor board. Like, All you I'll have to call say is, I put it in the mail. I don't have his address. I said either you pick it up or don't let the wind blow it away. But that's it. Like your paycheck like you is there if you want to pick it up. I like that you had an employee and didn't get an address. That's yeah. awesome. But he's been to the yard. Like, it's not a mystery where our shop is. And I said it would be at the shop. So, anyway, he came and got it. And that was the end of him. Actually, I think he worked at a roof truss place after that. Maybe he'll build the roof truss trusses for your new house. Oh, fuck. I wouldn't trust those trusses then. I Revenge little- is coming. It's just a matter of time, <laughs> motherfucker. I got a little game. Um, and it scares the hell out of me. But have you guys seen my stories this week? About how I've got two rock trucks. Yes. A 30-ton yeah. shovel and a D7 dozer at my yard. Yeah, I liked your post that said, if you have to ask how much, you can't afford it. Oh, and yeah. Loved well, it. I have no clue how much this is costing me. I don't even have an inkling. Of what a rock truck costs to run a day, or a D7 dozer, or a 30 ton shovel. And they've been there three days now. They're just wrapping up. Um, I asked, hey, so what's this going to cost me? Like, oh, well, we're not really sure. We got to add up this and that, or we'll get some numbers for you. Well, now the job is done. So it's yeah. hard to go back on everything yeah, once a, the work take is a done. Guess? Yeah, I'd like everybody to guess uh, what this is going to cost me. <laughs> Send it to me. So how many rock trucks are there? There's two rock trucks. Okay, and there's a 30-ton shovel? A 30-ton shovel. Oops. Okay, and what's the last piece? And a D7 dozer. Do you want me to tell you what I think? Absolutely. Let's say about well, two 30 rock trucks. About 35 hours per unit on the job. Uh so I think are we doing in between or we're we doing without to honor the late Bob Barker who passed <laughs> away this week? Are we doing the, the best without going over? Closest without going over? Well, I can't tell you because I still don't know. I know, but we can talk about it next week, and that would be a lead into to draw more listeners. You got right? it. Let's we can go trap these fuckers. <laughs> if you're listening right now, you won't know who won this till next week, and even next week, we're not going to reveal it till our worst hour. So you got to listen to the whole first hour in case we fuck up, and then you have so this is this is the kind of thing that keeps that drives podcasts forward is this kind of a level of excitement. How much did it cost to move the dirt at Chad's? At my expense. I, I'm going to say <laughs> $32,999. Should I write it down? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm super into this. I'm really excited about this. 
Mike, or we'll say PK, 32,900 and what? $99 and 99 cents. 99. And that was before tax? Nine. Yeah, before tax. Well, we got to do it before tax. Don't include the stupid Trudeau fucking communism tax. (laughs) (laughs) Mike, what do you think this is going to cost me? So just based off, you said 35 hours. And then uh, I just did a quick calculation to think uh, 26 to 50. Mike. It's the closest without going over, right? So I got a little bit of spread there. You got a bit of spread, motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> What's your guess, Chad? Chad says one dollar. He's got it. That's one dollar. <laughs> what Chad should say is twenty six two fifty one. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh man. Um. I'm thinking around 28k. Nice. Okay, but, so you're 28. Um these people are infam- infamously the cheapest in town for mm. low bid for everything. So, why didn't you make them bid on it then? <laughs> who are they going to bid against? I just said I need your D7 dozer. And then when it got there he's like, "You need some rock trucks and a shovel." I'm like, you're not wrong. I feel Go like on. three days to move twelve thousand yards of soil is pretty fair. Yeah, you because you posted today said it was twelve thousand yards. Twelve thousand yards, and so and it, shape up the property right. Like we got rid of a giant mountain and cut a nice swale through the property for all the water to drain. But uh, they did some nice work. Mind so, you, it was the president of the multi-million dollar company that was there in the dozer. Ooh, I didn't know that. No. I don't know if that affects the rates. They they tell me that they put him in the dozer so that he's not yelling at everybody <laughs> elsewhere. <laughs> that you just let him in the dozer so he's not yelling at the rest of the workers. Fair. But, I feel like that's fair. Yeah. So you're, um, Mike's 26.5, you're 28, and I'm 32.9. Tune in next week. Tune in next <laughs> week to see how much it costs to pile 12,000 yards of soil on Chad's property. Um, the good news is at $20 a yard, which I don't think is unreasonable. Uh, that's a quarter million dollar in topsoil. Ooh, you got to screen, but it. you have to screen it, which oh, okay. is another variable. And you also have to truck it if we're using it on our own jobs, right? Which, uh, we can make up at $20 a yard, but, um, yeah, I need a good deal on screening. So, well, you should buy a screening. At two hundred thousand dollars, it would eat all of my profit. <laughs> well, but what if you sold the screener after you were done with it? I don't have good luck selling machinery, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if that's a problem I want to get into. Today, Drake and I were on a site, and we, there was like some little crusher there. It's this little baby concrete crusher. And we were staring at the baby concrete crusher. And he said to me, that concrete crusher reminds me of Chad's Chinese excavators. Oh, no. <laughs> it had the same kind of look about it. And I, I said to him, you're not wrong. It does have that look about it. <laughs> the, the Chad Chinese excavator look. What's the look exactly? That to, what's that guy's name that replaces the starters in those things? Brandini. <laughs> <laughs> that concrete crusher looks like it could have a bit of Brandini action going on. <laughs> It might need some Brandini action at Concrete Company. So it, uh, I, I, oh, I did, I was, I did have a big announcement. Ooh. So I looked up the opposite of mastery, and that is ignorance. So we're going to have, I just, is, like, you want listening to this podcast in Cornwall. In Chad's half finished shop that is in no way prepared to host anything. We're going to be having Easy the now. exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing wrong with my shop. Well, no, but maybe it will be by the winter. That's Not fair. The, the one has heat. It's got a toilet. What else do you need? That's more shop than most landscapers have. Is there it pee is. in the toilet? Oh, it's stained. It's stained. Uh, we have hard water. So <laughs> as bad as Caleb's toilet was that one time. 
that I put them on blast for about having yellow water. Mine is red, red. <laughs> oh, like, no. Really? It's bad. Oh, yeah. I got to get a black toilet, I think, to camouflage it. So in Chad's fully prepared shop, which I take back and realize this was going to become emotional. <laughs> but <laughs> we are going to be holding this winter and Mike's going to announce the dates. <laughs> the hardscape ignorance course <laughs> where <laughs> Chad, well, landscape daddy, as he's known online, Mike from I am a hardscaper and paper King. We will be talking about all the absolute blunders that we did in business. And this course will only cost you, um, $30 each. Wow. And we will be catering it from Subway. $30 each. So, yeah. <laughs> We're going to lose that. money on this event. Probably. Yeah. I, well, that would be par for the course. <laughs> Do you think we got to make money at this? This is a hardscape ignorance event where. <laughs> I want to yeah. preface this by saying I only have a fire marshal limit of 200 people in the shop. That's pretty good. Do you have really 200 people? <laughs> the mezzanine and, hasn't been engineered and there's no permit for it. So <laughs> we can't stack people too high. Think we'll get 200 people out in the dead of winter to Cornwall? Uh, I, I do want to say <laughs> if you attend it, there will be an official airing of the grievances. Ooh, oh, wow. So you can bring your grievances to the Hardscape Ignorance event. I'll... <laughs> I'll make sure to clear plenty of parking. Can people <laughs> camp there? Uh yeah, you can camp in the barn right now. We don't have a tenant, so okay. There's a are are you are you renting to the barn to a non a non what? <laughs> You got busy Sorry. sending a text. It seems I, well, like I'm trying to run my this started a bit early and I wasted half an hour while you two were <laughs> while you two were working. I was like fucking around and then you, I started working and then you two stopped. So came on here and that kind of fucked me. So I'm just sending this quick text to tell someone what they're doing tomorrow. Hmm. It seems like this should be the work episode where we <laughs> just should, sit down. We, all just sit we down all complete work. our yeah. work. And did anyone did anyone ask any questions, Mike? Uh no. Oh, that's kind of disappointing. It is. M Mike, I have or PK, I have um a product rep uh question that I might like to run by you. What's sure. uh what's the protocol for uh that uh, the client may have an issue with? Sorry, you What's, broke up. Uh, sorry. Um, we put down a less than perfect uh, interlocking paver this week. And after mm -hmm. the first pallet was down, I called my retailer and said, if the rest of the pallets are like this, we're going to have issues. Um, and he called the product rep. Product rep called me. And then he says, what's the issue? I said, well, there, there's a variance in the paver and some are up and some are down and the Twinkies are thinner than the squares and the rectangles and um, the colors don't match the rest of the material that I have. And he says, what do you want me to do about it? With a half ignorant tone to his voice. And I said, I want you to fix it. I want you to do something to remedy the situation before I get 17 pallets of this stuff down and have to go back and pick up the Twinkies. And he mm -hmm. says, let me call you back. Did he call you what back? Uh, no, I called him back because he wanted to know the sticker, the data production and stuff like that. And then he's like, well, they should have sent you all the stuff from the same production run because we were having color issues too. And I said, well, this is what I have here. Sent that text to my retailer and he says, they direct shipped it. We didn't send you anything directly. They should have sent you stuff from all the same run. So did you send that back to him? Because that's awesome. No, I sent it to my retailer and then I have 
not a lot of patience for this particular product rep company. But anyway, we have the proper product now and we're full speed ahead. So what, oh, it got delivered? Yeah, my retailer had to pick it up from the location and deliver it to us and swap out the old stuff that was from a different production run. Mm. Um, so now it's all fine? So now it's all fine, except for the one pro one pallet that is still on the ground laid, which I'm hoping is going to be okay. Just got to lift up some Twinkies and put some stone dust underneath them. Stone dust. Oh, it's awful. It's like grading with like wet diapers or something. <laughs> like it's disgusting. Like, and that's spec on the job. So I'm like, okay, well, can't bring in any chip. And they say, we have this big pile of stone dust for you to use. Like they opened a curtain and fucking prize number one is a fucking big, big pile, pile of stone dust. It's just sitting pile of shit. Rained yeah. on for the whole summer. Yeah. Where there's rain and there's a, uh, Little whirly birds in it from the fucking spring whenever they dropped it oh off. <laughs> Just use this. Like absolutely what I want to be using. But anyway. So uh, crisis averted. But so my take on that situation when I was perhaps a product rep would have been don't lay it. If you lay it, the situation gets worse. Well, that's why how I called we, after how the can first we, pallet. Right? Yeah, how can we aggressively swap this out and get the right stuff there because once you lay it now there's a labor cost and yeah. you could argue there's a labor cost to any i actually thought about this whole scenario and whether it's something to this like just something to this you know i was thinking about how all these manufacturers have their like winter courses you know, they have their winter sh mm -hmm. shows. Yeah. And I thought maybe one of them could run a show based on how to recoup the money that you lose from fucked up pavers and fucked up runs and fucked up production and fucked up heights and fucked up color variances. And I would love for one of them to ball up and actually run that course where they're like, I, I when you buy these, product, for, when you that. buy product and it's all fucked up, because you lost, even if you fix it and it gets accepted, you lost, you had a crew there prepared to lay pavers that day. No matter what happened, you couldn't transport the transport the pavers back and forth. I think on average, like I, we don't actually do any hardscaping anymore. So I'm just going based on my old averages. Um, I think on average, that kind of shit used to happen to me relatively once or twice a month in an eight month wow. season. So that's 16 times a year. My crews are fucked by some kind of paver issue. So I want some one of the manufacturers to actually ball up and say, when you buy our product and lose this much money from labor standing around because we shipped fucked up shit, direct shipped fucked up shit, this is how you can budget for it and recoup it. I'd sit down to that free lunch. Is it catered, the event for that? They spend a lot of time talking about every other aspect of hardscaping. But they never spend any time talking about the endless mass amounts of lost money from hardscapers because the shit they produce is garbage. You're not wrong. Not all of it. It's not all, not I'm all not of it. All of it or all the time. But I, I would say we would bump into paver issues when we were doing heavy pavers at least two or three times a month that caused a delay on the jobs. S finding fucking shit from the same run, fucking height variances, leveling them fucking out, or the pavers aren't square, or the Twinkies are two qu a quarter inch too small and fuck up all the lines. Like, <laughs> what else? Do color variances. Fucking, yeah. it doesn't, you know, and I just wish one of them would get honest and real about the situation because it, they're obviously trying hard to produce good stuff. I don't think there's any manufacturer out there intentionally producing garbage because yeah, it you causes don't make money. I can tell you from being on the manufacturer side, it causes absolute fucking havoc in your life as a manufacturer when garbage goes out of the plant. Total they don't want it either. But maybe one of them could ball up and actually say, You need to start allowing 
for 200 hours of wasted time per season from fucking manufacturer defects and problems so that you can recoup that instead of all of them just pretending none of that stuff ever happens because whoever is the first person to admit it and start to teach hardscapers how to budget for it and how much it's going to cost them i would buy all my product from that company because at least they fucking care about you and care about your business and are being honest about the problems you're going to incur and if they had a set standard of ways to deal with each of those problems and that would be better than the sort of behind the black curtain way that it's done now. I think if one manufacturer did that, then there'd be a large quantity of contractors that would say, well, I've never had a problem from this manufacturer and they don't say that. And then that manufacturer might say, yeah, we don't have those problems. And that would be enough to get people over to that manufacturer. I don't yeah, know. But then you can find out firsthand for yourself that they do have those problems and then be even more pissed about it. Sorry, I've been doing this for 35 years. I don't care. I've bought shit from every single manufacturer yeah. that's been garbage. Yeah. And they all deal with it in different ways. I'm just saying, who's going to be the first one to be honest that the problem exists? Don't think that would fly past the marketing department. No, that's why I probably don't work there. <laughs> probably why I don't still work there. I just, uh, no, I just think that it's, it's like the non-talked about issue, right? Right. No one talks about it. No one wants to piss off the manufacturers. I don't buy fuck all from them anymore, so I don't care. <laughs> I was going to say, you <laughs> yeah. just said how you'd buy all your products from that manufacturer, but if you don't buy any product, <laughs> those aren't pretty heavy words. I'm, no, I'm just joking. The, the point is, I'm just, it's like this. I talk to people all the time that are having crazy, people call me all the time with this exact question because obviously I did it for a living saying, what would you do about this? Or what would you do about that? Or how should I handle this with a rep? I probably get four or five phone calls a week about that shit. From about every, not about one man, but all the manufacturers. Because they're all trying to produce like mass, pro mass product. If you stacked 500 Campbell's cans on top of each other, they would end up at different heights. Like if you spat, stacked rows of 50 Campbell's cans, they're all going to be different heights because those cans aren't perfect. The problem is that everyone just opens them and throws them away in that manufacturing process. Whereas we're taking shit people are manufacturing and trying to install it to precise guidelines. But it's the same kind of plant. It's a manufacturing plant where people are just trying to mass manufacture stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'm not buying the can. I'm buying what's inside of the can. So I want the product to be right. I don't care about the packaging. The packaging all sucks. It's all wrapped and that stupid netting and all this stuff. But regardless, I want what I'm paying for to be A1. And I understand it doesn't happen all the time, but it seems like every time I need it to happen to go flawlessly, that's the time it shits the bed. When I'm in a pinch and I got to get this job done for the end of the week or something because school starts next week and I couldn't be in until Friday and now I got a week to do 2,000 square feet of heavy fucking pavers. Everybody's back is sore. Oh, the colors aren't matching up. Take that one out. They didn't dig the base far enough here. Yeah. That's, uh, that's been the week. Damn. Story of the week. And that is the shitty part of commercial landscaping. Put the soldier course in, but everything is round and the pavers are too big, so you can't make a nice soldier course. So omit the soldier course and there's curbs on each side of everything that don't necessarily need to be there. And water's going to sit here and there because now there's curbs where there don't need to be curbs. And is it regular sand or poly sand? Poly sand. Yeah. You haven't even got to the real trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The gaps are very small on this paper. Oh, that sucks more. Yeah. Yeah. They're tiny, tiny gaps. That sucks, tiny spacers that sucks on the side. Most. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like trying to re sand four by eights after you've lifted them Ooh. and put them back down. You can pack that for days and days and you're still going to have holes in it. Yeah. It's just not fine enough to get in. No. No. That's so. the truth. That's fucking brutal. So, what happens if you don't meet that deadline, Chad? Nothing. Nothing. You just don't look good. You know, like okay. then kids are coming, walking in the school and 
you're trying to lay pavers beside them and you can't run the saw because it's uh nine o'clock on a Monday morning and kids are trying parents are trying to take pictures of their kids on their first day and you know, it's uh you just don't look like, like the good guy. Kindergarten yeah. classroom was open yeah. and the dust is blowing in. <laughs> <laughs> We're cutting right beside a daycare while while the kids are outside almost all day. Wow. And wow. you feel bad, but the show must go on here. Like you have to do this work or it's not gonna get done. And then there'll be some real hell to pay. But some, you... this this isn't your fault, right? Someone right. passed you this project late. Yeah. But isn't that always the case? And then the it falls papers, on you. Yeah. And the pavers were in today and they left a hell of a mess. And now no one can drive anywhere because the asphalt's fresh. And your Chad said microphone's not working. <laughs> it's Chad. Some more some more bad bad news for Chad. Chad. Chad's got a lot of bad news going on. His computer's completely <laughs> muted itself. He's no, no, it didn't. No, no, you're, you're back. Good. Yeah, you're I'm back. Good. Yeah. yeah, you're back. Uh, what happened with the pavers? Other than they paved the parking lot, now no one can drive on it. Uh, well, there's a little ledge that separates where my trailer and all our skids and material are from the rest of the job, and that's got a sort of bridge of pavers through it, and they had to pave along both sides of that, so everything's landlocked in there, and uh, so there's no moving the pavers until that asphalt cures yep and um so we got it our mini cure, it here. won't cure in august when it's no i was thinking should i take the water truck out and try and cool it down and then we had to get pavers close to the job so we're like thankfully the new skids here has a roll-up door and not one of those stupid fucking doors that have to where the arms have to be right slammed to the bottom or else the door won't open what makes those doors Chad? the roll-up door no the other door oh um i don't know who makes those the company is white oh wow uh, for the most part the I've people forgotten. or the no uh Mike, well made in america now mike's but, uh... dodging into the problems <laughs> <laughs> no at least it wasn't me <laughs> um so anyway we're landlocked we're trying to get this job done every school we ever did is always some massive rush for landscaping at the end and yeah. every school we ever did we got back charged for some kind of asphalt parking lot damage that we didn't do <sighs> from every general every general would just send us a bill for a thousand bucks and put asphalt damage it got to the point where we were like recording that like we didn't go on the asphalt fuck you we would get dinged for asphalt damage and we hadn't even been there for three weeks like when we were done before it was just that was the the number one, every general contractor's number one profit is how can we ding the drywall guy, the duck guy, the window guy that hasn't been there for eight months. Let's ding them all for 500 bucks. Wow. Do you, do you think that could have been remedied with a site walkthrough at the end of the job? No, because the damage is already there and they don't know who to blame. So they just blame everyone. Meanwhile, the damage could be from a pizza delivery guy who got the wrong address and looped through the fucking parking lot and went out the other side. Do you that, that then, happened on a driveway we paved? Yeah, we talked about that. Oh, did we? Okay. Yeah. They came back and rolled it for free, did they not? Uh I don't know what happened in the end because we actually got X saved from that whole conversation, which was awesome. Yeah. It's where you want to be. But one of our um, one of our big jobs we did two years ago, three years ago, the lady texted us and said, Hey, can I get the professional pictures you guys had done? Because I'm putting my house for sale. And those are some of the nicest pictures in my backyard. And I want to use it as a big selling feature. And so Kelly was like, oh, yeah, no problem. We'll send them. And then I was talking to Kelly and I said, fucking goddamn right. That's another person that won't call us about any fucking problems. <laughs> I love it when they sell their house. All the leaves fell I off the fucking it. tree and landed on the patio and it's stained. I don't know you. Fuck off. If it's a new <laughs> owner. I like, always feel like it's a weight off my shoulders whenever... I drive by or I hear a client saying, Hey, we're selling our house, but we'll need you on the next one. I'm like, great. I'm off the hook for that one that we did. Yep. <laughs> and then you have those clients that cling to their houses for nine years. Yeah. <laughs> They're shitty houses with the railing that 
mysteriously disappeared with the lockbox haunting my soul. Here's an interesting topic. What do you guys think about this quote? 